recording is being recorded. Oh, jeez. Okay. <clears throat> Today we're going to tie up our long series on the early and the high Renaissance and looking at, um, at the uh, late Renaissance and especially a very puzzling phenomenon that happens, and that is mannerism. And notice that mannerism has that ism at the end. <clears throat> and that's strange because we see Gothic art, we see Renaissance art, we see Baroque art, we see Rococo art, but it's not until the 19th century we start seeing Romanticism, Realism, Impressionism, and so forth. Um, uh, and also Marxism, Capitalism, right? All these, it, it enters uh, the political discourse as well as the artistic discourse. And that whole 19th century and 20th century modernist idea is an avant garde idea, that they're always going. There is a progressive uh, uh, idea of history. Okay, and so it's a little strange that in the middle of all of this, halfway between the Renaissance on the one hand and the Baroque period of the 1600s and the 1700s, we have this strange little phenomenon called mannerism that takes place actually at the same time as the late Renaissance. So it's like an alternative style that develops. And, um, and so we're going to uh, look at it and, and we're going to look at the end of why it is that art historians have chosen to give it this almost modernist name, right, mannerism. During the uh, 1500s, when it was actually happening, these people were called the manieri or the mannered ones in Italian. But this not only included the kind of strange uh, 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 artwork of what we call mannerists, but anyone who adopted the manner of say Raphael or, or Leonardo or, or Titian or any of those people were also called manieri. Uh, uh, and so it's, uh, but it's not mannerism. So we're gonna look at all of that. I, I open with this very strange little painting by an artist called Parma Giannino because he was short and he's the little guy from Parma who entered the discourse in Roman art and does a lot of uh, different stuff. And this is an interesting piece that he does when he's still a teenager, right? He's just become a maestro, he's maybe 19, maybe 20, maybe 21 years old. And it's a small painting, probably no bigger than the image that you see on your computer screen before you. It's called a uh, self-portrait in a convex mirror. And as you can see, it's a self-portrait in a convex uh, mirror. In other words, he records the distortions in the convex mirror. It's interesting because the painting itself is painted on a piece of convex wood. And so it actually has that uh, curving physical form to it as well. And I opened with this because uh, not only is Parmigianino one of the foremost uh, and most radical of the mannerists, but he's also, but I also thought this uh, opened up nicely because introduced the idea of distortion, of moving away from that Renaissance idealism toward something else. And it's unclear exactly what it is, right? And by the way, art historians don't know how to uh, categorize mannerism. It's still a critical, uh, uh, very controversial field within the field. Okay, so in the Renaissance, like Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, we see idealization of form. Everything is perfect. It's balanced, it's harmonious, it's unified. The colors are harmonious and, and so forth, okay? Now we see instead strange mannerist distortions. Uh, and, and, and when I say strange, you know, we come after the 20th century when some really strange art uh, was produced. So we have a high level before we call something strange. But I hope to elucidate in the next hour exactly how this is strange and how profoundly strange it is. And the painting on the bottom is uh, Tintoretto's Last Supper, almost a century after uh, Leonardo's uh, and uh, probably the strangest thing are the strange angels that appear out of the, uh, the smoke from the gas lamps in this um, dramatic uh, uh, painting by Tintoretto. But let's go and take a very uh, kind of simple and easy to get uh, a high Renaissance piece like Raphael's Madonna of the Meadow that we looked at before. And we uh, noticed that uh, it's balanced and harmonious and so forth. It also utilizes the three primary colors, blue, uh, yellow kind of of the flesh, the orange, 
uh, of the flesh and, and even the yellowish green of the background and, um, and all taking place within a, a equilateral triangle uh, within which the forms deport themselves. And there's not a blemish on the skin, they're idealized, they're, they look like angels, they look like Greek gods and goddesses. Okay, so this is the standard. This is what everybody measured themselves against, uh, you know, uh, high Renaissance idealization. Well, we have not that long afterwards, 20 years perhaps, Parma Giannino's Madonna with a long neck. Um, and at first, when you look at it, if you're not, it looks like another Raphael's kind of Madonna, but the more closely you look at it, the stranger Parma Giannino's uh, interpretation of this, uh, of essentially the same uh, iconographic uh, subject matter, but in a very, very strange way. And I'm gonna kind of try to uh, de uh, deconstruct it here. First of all, of course, the long neck. No one has a neck that long. He really exaggerates the neck and she has this kind of curve to it, but it does have that Leonardo West uh, sfumato and, um, and, um, and uh, kind of feminine uh, grace and beauty. So the face is still fairly idealized. The hairdo is very high fashion uh, for the 1520s. But if we look at Christ on her lap, lap, we begin to notice the kind of strangeness of it. Notice how large the infant is. He's a toddler more than a baby, but also notice the way, for example, his arm hangs limply off his mother's uh, left hand uh, and his head, I guess he's asleep, but it almost looks as if he's dead. And this, and the arm hanging that way is exactly a quotation of Michelangelo's Pietà, where Mary holds the dead Christ. So there's a reference here uh, to death. Uh, and it seems to be slipping right off her lap. It's a very precarious uh, positioning of, of the infant Christ because he looks like he's gonna slip off onto the floor in, in, in a minute. There's also a reference to uh, death in that urn that that boy brings in uh, to the left. He brings in this uh, urn, which of course is a symbol of death. Notice also here, Mary has a sash, exactly like the sash that contains the signature of Michelangelo in the Pieta, about 15 uh, years uh, earlier. I want you to notice, however, the strange proportions of this boy. I guess he's an angel, he's nude, and uh, he looks pretty realistic here. His hands are very mannered, you know, but, uh, but he holds very delicately and sort of presents this urn to the Virgin, it seems almost like an offering. And he looks at her face, but look at the strange proportions. Here is his chest, here's a nipple, but here already is his hip. So there's kind of no middle part where the belly would go. It's shielded by the, uh, by the, uh, by the urn, but you still you, know, you can't see it. And then that leg, right? Talk about proportional. Once we get into the leg, the leg goes way, 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 way down here. In fact, the virgin herself is a very, she's nine heads tall. So if she stood up, she'd be like the 50 foot woman. It mitigates it by having her sit down. Uh, it's not that he doesn't know how to draw, he is perfectly capable of drawing. These are purposeful distortions. But the question is, why? Now, I want to, you'll also notice in the background here are these boys. Now, how many children can you fit in the small space between the, the virgin's chair? We can't see the chair, but we know it's there because she seems to be sitting on it. And behind her and to her left are one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven boys that can't possibly fit in that, you know, six inches between the red velvet um, uh, uh, backing that hangs a piece of cloth. And uh, so there's a strange distortion. Also notice on the right, it looks like a colonnade. If you look at the bottom where that strange figure is, it looks like a colonnade. Each individual column uh, uh, projects its own shadow and you can count the shadows there. But if you look up above the Virgin's cape, there is only one column. So it goes from a multi-column structure to just one column. 
And the column, if I can go back here, is almost, it doesn't reach to anything. It almost looks like a, a smokestack to us, of course it wasn't. Now, if we go in here, we see this little figure. And the figure is really, really attenuated. He's very, very tall. He's very, very stretched out. And he looks outside of the picture. So we imagine he is perhaps an Old Testament prophet that uh, we, you know, we, a virgin shall conceive or something like that. But instead, he seems to look away from the viewer, away from the virgin, and something is happening off the set. Uh, notice also that um, if we go back, he is out of proportion. The, um, the, um, if you look at the base of the arrow here, if you look at the base of her pedestal, I guess you call it, and then you look at him, his foot, there is a very little space. If you diagram this out as a perspective thing, he would be only a, a foot, maybe two and a half feet from the virgin. Remember, in perspective, you can measure space. If he's only a foot or two be behind her, he's tiny, like a little, you know, Barbie doll or something like that. And notice also, now this may be, this may be a thing of the aging of the pigments, but notice that we can see right through him. We look at the steps of this temple that seems to have all sorts of pillars down here, and uh, it's, it, he uh, becomes, uh, it's like a ghost image. Now, as I said, that may be a technical thing that he didn't glaze correctly and it, um, and it uh, came through later, we don't know. But it wouldn't surprise me in such a strange painting as this for him to actually conceive of it as this ghostly figure in the background. Notice also there is a kind of, um, there's kind of a perverse sexuality to it. Um, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but the virgin, her garment seems to be wet, that it really reveals uh, her nude body underneath. You can, for example, see the navel as if she had been drenched with water or standing on a ship in a, in a, in a, in a sea. Now, it's true the ancient Greeks used this kind of a method to reveal the body underneath, but to do it for the virgin and to give her an erect nipple I suppose it would be cold, uh, or maybe she's lactating, or perhaps she's, uh, you know, uh, turned on. Uh, so, uh, so it's very strange. Um, and, uh, and one of the very strangest things about mannerists is no one says it's strange. No one from the time points out these strange things that seem to go so much against the balanced harmony, order, rational space, perspective, chiaroscuro, uh, rationality, order, unity, um, all of that. And it seems to, in, in an opinion like this, it seems like uh, almost systemically going against each of those uh, uh, stylistic traits. What a difference it is now that I point it out to you, uh, I, I hope how different it is from the clear, orderly, you know, balanced, uh, harmonious, unified Raphael of only a few years previously, you know. And this guy, he knows Raphael. I mean, he knows the style. You can see the similarity in the faces. And both of them are influenced in the faces by Leonardo da Vinci, of course. Here's another, Rosso Fiorentino. Again, it's another nickname. Rosso mean red, he has red hair. He had red hair, so they call him red. And uh, he, uh, he's a Florentine, I believe, and he emerges at this time. And this again, on first glance, if we're just you know, not used to the language of idealized form from the Renaissance, it might be easy to kind of superficially say, oh, it's a crucifixion or a deposition. They're, the, uh, they're taking, the disciples are taking uh, Christ off the cross, his dead body off the cross, and his mother and, and, um, and, and some women and, and St. John the Evangelist uh, weep inconsolably at the foot. But if we look carefully at it, it's interesting that it, done, it all, all the twisting shapes seem to take place on the surface of the design. They don't go back into space. 
there is kind of a generalized triangular form that starts down here, goes up through her, up to this figure up here, and it comes down through the ladder. So there is that attenuated uh, triangle. But there's also all sorts of pretzel-like twisting forms that sort of weave their way around the composition. These figures at the foot of the altar are strange. The woman on the left, they look like they're illuminated by an, uh, a blast of, you know, a lightning. Uh, they're suddenly, uh, brilliantly illuminated by a cool light. Uh, and the garments are kind of stiff. Uh, this uh, figure actually looks at us and Mary is hidden in shadow. And this is another one of the Marys. I guess this is Mary Magdalene throws herself at the feet of the uh, mother of Jesus. And then to her right is St. John. Now, let's look at the proportions of St. John. It is true that he's bent over. But if you look at where his, uh, let me see where my arrow is. If you look at he's bent over and this is where his hips would be. And this is where his feet are. So it's extremely attenuated and distorted. Now the question is why did he do it? Now a lot of people, modern people would say, well, it's for expressive purposes. He's, he's uh, brilliantly lighting it, he's distorting it to make it more impactful for us. Um, and we see this especially in the kind of the crazy uh, gesticulations uh, and machinations of Joseph of Arimathea and the other, uh, I guess, uh, men who take Jesus down from the cross. I think that's Joseph of Arimathea, one of his uh, Pharisee disciples. And it was his tomb that, that Jesus was placed in, you know? And so that's him on the top, but it's very strange kind of hanging over the cross. This guy shouting at this one, uh, he does capture the heaviness of Christ's body. And it has a, a, a weird green uh, quality to it. But the strangest thing, is this smile on Jesus's dead face, you know, almost a post-sexual kind of a satisfaction or some, something like that. It has sexual connotations or it has, not just for me, uh, but for other art historians. A really interesting uh, book, if you want to read it sometime, is The Sexuality of Christ by, um, by a very, very famous um, author published during the 80s. Um, Leo Steinberg. And Leo Steinberg's one of these guys, he can do Renaissance, he can do Picasso, he can do anything. And I had the privilege of meeting him once. Uh, and uh, yeah, he was holding forth at the museum, you know, uh, as this uh, doyen. But anyway, uh, uh, he did a very famous and very controversial book where he found all these kind of sexual connotations uh, uh, in, in various different um, paintings and sculptures of the old masters, including of this and including some other mannerist pieces, not surprisingly. But it, it has a strange, it's strange. It's, it's strange. I like it, but it's, it's very, it's a, a strange coda to the Renaissance. And, um, and it's, as I said, strange that they didn't think it's strange. Here's one of my very favorites, Jacopo Pantormo. And Pontormo is interesting because he has a diary uh, as well as a biography. And he says a lot of symptomology. He so seems to have colitis or something like that. And, uh, and his diary is very strange. And he is widely considered to have been kind of mentally ill, uh, although very, very talented and actually worked uh, with Michelangelo. When Michelangelo was in his 60s, Michelangelo would do drawings and then Pontormo would make them into paintings. And we have two or three of them. And then there was some sort of disagreement between the younger and the older artist, but he was never an apprentice. He was like in his thirties, he was a completely mature master. And it was during the time that he was kind of being Michelangelo. Michelangelo didn't like to paint, you know, Pontormo is a really good painter and really can do the style of Michelangelo when he wants to, but when he doesn't want to, he gets very weird and manneristic. And this painting, and it's above an altarpiece in Florence, um, and uh, I remember the first time I saw it, I just wandered into the church for the first time I was in Italy and I was struck by it even then, you know, it's, it, it's big. And it's um, at the Capone uh, Chapel in Santa Felicita Church. It's an oil painting. And there's also paintings in the, 
in the dome, there's a God, the Father, and so forth. And so what it is, is Christ's been taken off the cross, and these angels, I guess, are going to place him in the tomb. And at first glance, again, it looks, you know, a normal, but you wonder, like, where are all these people standing? Are they on, you know, bleachers, like at a baseball game, you know, on a ladders? You know, they, they don't say, and there's no indication of the earth, except for the little cloud in the sky. And the sky, by the way, is green. It's a greenish blue. It's a very strange kind of sky. The whole thing kind of looks, it's very strange painting. Now, again, there's kind of a triangle, as you can see, having its apex up here and coming down here. So that stabilizes the whole thing to a certain extent, but there's kind of a hole in the middle. And it seems like the, co the uh, composition winds around. Let's see if I get my arrow, where's my arrow here? See, so it winds around and around and around and around and around and around. And around. End. And it all is sort of balanced on this angel's toe. It's just teetering there like that. It's a, a thing. Now, some of the people, this woman who turns away from us, there's no place for her to be. There's a figure behind her reaching, holding Christ. There's Christ in front of her. Where is she? She's like those five or six boys in the Parma Giannino, uh, you know, Madonna with a long neck. The space is not rational. Now Mary has it almost like in slow motion. And notice some strange details. For example, there's no sleeve that separates her arm from her cloak. And she seems to sort of wave goodbye as Jesus is taken away from her by these angels, uh, very worried angels. Now the Christ body is directly, directly the Pieta of Michelangelo. So obviously, you know, he's working with a maestro at this point. These two maestri are working together. Pontormo in his mid thirties, uh, Michelangelo in his sixties, fifties, sixties. And, um, and, and, you know, it's, and the Christ is idealized. He's beautiful. He's, you know, um, without a, really a mark on his body, except just the tiny marks of the a lance in his side and his, and, but other than that, he's, he's beautiful. And, and this we would expect in a Renaissance painting. But look at the angels. They look like they wandered off the Sicilian ceiling. I remember all those nudes that make like 22 of them or something that are, we don't know how to explain them exactly, but we usually think of them as angels. And here's another unwinged, but how strangely lit he is, how pink his body is, and yet how blue the light that comes uh, from the right. So there's a light that illuminates his body, but in a very pink, almost as if he has a pink, you know, body stocking on or something, because it's a different color than his face or his legs. Now, if he stood up, he'd be one of these very, very tall, very elongated figures. You don't notice it as much because he's uh, kneeling. Uh, uh, but you can see how the whole composition is very precariously balanced off him. But I want to also call attention to the expressions on the angels' faces. You know, these are supposed to be angels. They should know. They should almost be turning to us, if you think of the story, right? They should be turning to have no fear. He seems like he's dead now, but in three days of rise, glory, right? But they don't look like that. Look at those expressions. These are expressions of fear, and confusion, profound fear and profound confusion. Like, oh, this wasn't supposed to happen. What do we do now? And they look at us, they look at the viewer entreating us to explain how is it possible that he could have died? It just, it doesn't make any sense. It's a, just an utter tragedy. Look at this angel's face. This is like, what, you know? looking to us, and we have no answers either. And then he even includes himself over here, uh, a removed in modern dress and an ambiguous relationship spatially to the rest of them. And he looks a little like this angel down here, but you can see that he is a man in his uh, mid to late uh, 30s. And he looks sort of, uh, you know, uh, adoringly and melancholy uh, lamentfully at the whole scene that seems to be unfolding in front of him. Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's very, very strange. And he was a very celebrated artist and he got a lot of commissions, but he had a lot of, you know, Vasari tells us that he was plagued by his ceaseless fancies and often couldn't work. And he details uh, his diet and, and his feces in his, in his, in his, uh, in his uh, diary. It's not the kind of diary like you would think that reveals his soul. It kind of reveals strange things. He also became very strange. He was paranoid. And so he, uh, he, he closed off all the doors on the first floor and he could only get into his place by going up a ladder. So he hit the lower ladder. So that he's a very centric guy. He was very skilled. He was um, sort of almost adopted in a way by the Medici family when he was 18 or 19. Uh, he went to several different masters, uh, including according to um, uh, uh, Vasari, briefly Leonardo da Vinci. And ended up at the studio of, of uh, Andrea del Sarto in uh, Florence. But Vasari tells us that the, the other boys were mean to him and he didn't get along well with them. And so forth. So he's a troubled, you know, mentally ill, maybe one of the first kind of documented mentally ill artists. And, then, and you know, he was, um, I wrote an essay on him uh, 25 years ago. And uh, because when I looked at the diary and I looked at the, um, the biography, he had encountered a lot of death. He was an orphan. His mother died when he was two or three. Father died when he was eight. Uh, he was shuffled off to different uh, apprenticeships, which kind of served as surrogate uh, parents for him. And so I postulated that this whole painting represents him not being able to, to resolve these problems of death. Children don't really understand death. And so his, his uh, meditation on the death of Christ reveals his, um, his um, meditation on the death of his own parents and the death of his own father. And Michelangelo kind of becomes almost a father figure for him that he attaches to. Well, anyway, I got kind of psychoanalytic, perhaps more than is warranted because I don't want to take away from the profound mystery and beauty of the painting. But I thought like it's interesting this person who's so obviously in many ways uh, psychologically troubled uh, nonetheless uses this instability to sort of uh, do interesting painting. He's very skilled. Michelangelo saw some of his frescoes that he did when he was 19 and said, this artist will attain to heaven. Um, and um, and, um, and uh, in fact, they had a very interesting and unprecedented uh, relationship, uh, a, a professional relationship. Um, he, um, this is another of his paintings. And again, it's, this is the Supper at Emmaus. This is one of those resurrection stories. It's found in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus, uh, well, the two disciples, puzzled by the death of Jesus and alarmed by the uh, women's um, tales of seeing the empty tomb, uh, are walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, about a half day's journey by foot, and a stranger joins them on the road and they talk to the stranger, he's very inspiring, and um, they explain to him about Jesus and they're puzzling, and, they, they, and the stranger explains all sorts of things to them that they couldn't possibly have known. And uh, they invite him to come to stay at their place at Emmaus. They come to that. And the stranger said, I can't, I have to continue on, but I will have, come in and have a cup of wine, break bread with us, you know, because he was another Jew, you know. And, um, and so they, the disciples invite him in. They don't name the disciples, you don't know who they are, but not the apostles. And, um, and then Jesus breaks, bless the bread and the wine, you know, like Jews do on the Shabbat. And, um, and then they recognize that the stranger was actually Christ and then he disappears. So it's one of those miraculous, you know, resurrection uh, things of the miraculous sort of transfigured uh, body of Christ. And there is the moment of recognition. One disciple is still pouring wine he doesn't recognize yet, but the one on the right seems to have realized. Again, it's lit by this lightning bolt of cool light. It's very strange. Um, they didn't do his homework because it should have been uh, matzah if it's a th your third or fourth day of Passover, but uh, you know they dinner rolls instead. And, in the, and the, hovering above Jesus's head is this triangle with an eye. It was a Masonic symbol. Uh, later, uh, it's also on the dollar bill, for example. 
And uh, it means the all-seeing eye of God in the triangle represents the Trinity and the Christian concept of God. And in the background are the monks who actually uh, commission the painting for a dining room, for a refectory. And so they're shown kind of ghostly uh, in a way and here the prior sort of gesturing toward Christ as if they're breaking through the bounds of time and the contemporary uh, portraits of these individual uh, monks join in at the supper, but the people at the supper don't see them. So there's a ghostly kind of presence of these figures gesturing. It's very, it's very chilling. It's, it's almost a spooky painting. Um, and, um, and, and it captures that, you know, that time and space is sort of warped at the uh, unnaturalness of Jesus's resurrection and it switches everything and breaks through time and space and all that sort of stuff. So it's a very mystical kind of interpretation. Um, so he's not just a mentally ill person, but uh, you know we know that he had this symptomology and all the figures are distorted. The perspective is, is not correct. We're sort of looking down on the table, but we're looking straight across at Jesus. So he's, and he knows it. He knows he's breaking the rules of perspective, but why? That's the, that's the question of why and what does it mean? Now, let's look at Correggio. Correggio comes from Parma. He was the teacher of Parma Giannino, and he's a high Renaissance artist, although he has his mannerist moments. But this is a very high Renaissance painting, I think from the 30s, of, of the 1530s or 40s. And it's Venus and, her, uh, and Cupid, her son, are asleep. And they're this fawn over the goat's feet, uh, you know, um, sees them asleep. And, um, and, um, and, and it's a Renaissance painting. I wanted to point out, not around the same time, is Bronzino's strange mannerist painting, which is called um, Allegory of Time. It's Venus Cupid, Time and Folly, I think is what it's called. And the old man is time and he reveals, you know, and Venus is the goddess of beauty. So we have a Venus and a Cupid, okay? So oh, what I wanted to emphasize here is that, they, that again, that um, composition that takes place like pretzel-like on the surface of the painting, but doesn't go all that deep into space. Look at how Venus goes back into space, how he foreshortens the body of her and her little Cupid, a uh, son, a slight lying asleep. I love Correggio, you know, but in the same time. So it's not that they forgot how to do it or anything like that. It's conscious distortion. Now let's look a little closer at the Bronzino because it's a very strange painting. First of all, there's this whole kind of incestuous quality to Venus and Cupid. Cupid kisses her, but uh, in an erotic sort of way that's not appropriate to a mother and child or one, but we don't usually think very much more eroticized. And he's the god of love. So of course he is. And notice, for example, how he um, plays with her breast uh, sexually. Uh, but notice also how, how can this head fit on this body? You know, it's kind of strange, uh, autonomically. Uh, if we look closely at it, we see that as he embraces his mother, and like I said, I don't know how that head is attached to those shoulders, but Venus stealthily disarms him. She's pulling the arrows out of his quiver. So she's stealthily uh, uh, doing that. To her right is this uh, Herod, and I forget, the, there are a lot of different interpretations of this, but here's this old lady uh, screaming. Uh, very strange, you know, what, what does that have to do with the allegory? Uh, also, this a uh, very strange uh, female figure that emerges behind, I think this is Folly that's throwing the, the roses at the uh, divine couple. But here is this girl dressed in modern dress, you know, girl, maybe 12 years old, and she holds a rock in her hand and kind of, you know, holds that forward. But if you look at the hand carefully, you will notice that it's not, it's her right shoulder, but it's a left hand coming out of her right arm. You see the thumb is on the wrong side. It's not because he didn't know which side the thumb was on. Uh, he's purposely doing this 
Uh, and this is her other hand over here. So I don't know how she, you know, contortionist sort of uh, thing. And the whole thing probably just throws rosebuds at the whole uh, thing. Uh, and there's a tragedy and comedy, these masks uh, in the, uh, and it's an allegory, right? And it's been interpreted a lot of different ways. But what I want to point out of is kind of the perverse eroticism of it, the strange distortions, the, um, the uh, you know, left hands coming out of uh, right arms, that sort of uh, thing. Tintoretto, if we move to uh, Venice, I have to speed it up because I want to get through the whole thing. It's just so fascinating to kind of deconstruct and, and see like, wow, how weird these guys can get. Tintoretto is one of the people he can do high Renaissance or he can do mannerism. And here he's kind of in between. Um, it's a big crowd at the Last Supper. Uh, there is some elongation to forms like the steward over here and these people. But the most uh, extraordinary thing is the lighting. They all have these glow around their head. It's almost like a communion, a Catholic communion where he passes out communion wafers again. It's not a Jewish looking Passover, their dinner rolls on the table, but that's how they conceived of it. Um, but I want to point out the extraordinary um, smoke coming out of the gas lamps turns into angels there and over to the right as well. The smoke uh, of the lamp sort of forms these incredible angels that we see, but no one else sees to, to, uh, to uh, show us of the sacredness of the moment and the presence of these divine uh, beings at this important uh, meal. Uh, Tintoretto, uh, as I said, uh, he can get very mannerist. I think this is him at his most mannered. Uh, and this is Christ uh, walking on the Sea of Galilee. That is, you know, the story he comes walking across the sea to his disciples that are on the boat at, at night. And they see his figure walking on the water. And so here, but look at how strange the water looks. Look at how mannered the clouds are. Look at how elongated Christ's body is. Look how it's lit. You know, here's Peter steps off the boat uh, to walk on the water to meet Jesus. And then once Peter realizes uh, that he, what's happening, then, then he, he falls and Jesus has to rescue him. But it's a very strange and very kind of surreal painting. It's almost as if, uh, you know, the scene is uh, on marijuana or LSD or some sort of hallucinogenic uh, drug, uh, space and time are warped. Uh, and this is probably appropriate to a miraculous scene. Well, this is an international thing. We looked before uh, last time at Hans Holbein, who has uh, that uh, painting of the ambassadors, uh, but it has a skull stretched out uh, uh, on the bottom. And, and, and there are other Germans that are into this. Mannerism is not just confined to Italy, but is really an international movement. And many places like France goes right from Gothic leaps right over the Renaissance almost, uh, almost to, to uh, plunge itself right into uh, mannerism. And here King Francis the first in a very, you know, mannered hands and so forth by Jean Cloé, he's a uh, French. But here, uh, the decorations at the palace at Fontainebleau um, uh, uh, were decorated by the Italian Rosso Fiorentino. And we saw his deposition earlier, right? The Christ, the green, Christ. And he ends up as the court artist of Francis I and brings the manner of style to the French. And here's one of the frescoes. That's part of this, 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 um, this uh, decorative scheme in which we also see, for example, um, um, uh, stucco figures and so forth. He is a large workshop. And so he trains a lot of French artists, but they're trained not really in the Renaissance style, but, but in the manner of style. And here, a very mannered painting also by Rosso of these, uh, you know, Apollo and some other, uh, um, you know, mythological uh, beings. Uh, here Apollo has his harp. Notice how long his legs are. Notice how everyone's face looks just alike, um, very mannered. Now, the most mannered of all the mannerists is El Greco. And they, it just means the Greek. And his, he was, his real name was Theotokopoulos, Domenicos Theotokopoulos. And no one could pronounce it. And he, he started off as an icon painter in Greece, <clears throat> as an apprentice there, and then moved to Italy and apprenticed Tintoretto. But he turns up the mannerism. Remember Tintoretto with Christ walking on the water? Well, here El Greco takes it a step further 
uh, more strange. Look at the strange lighting. Look at the strange subject matter even. This is St. John, the disciple of Jesus, and uh, supposedly, according to a legend, he was invited to a dinner at someone who wanted to poison him, an enemy of the Christians. Uh, I think he goes to India, it's the, the legendary life of this saint, and um, uh, semi-legendary, and uh, it's not in the Bible. And, um, and so they, he's going to drink a cup of poison and snakes come out, and uh, that's the poison. And then he realizes, and then he can drink it. It's you know, because the, the devils, this poison uh, left when it saw the sanctity of the saint. And he says, see here, this is, this is the elimination of evil. So he uses it as a way of conversion. Okay, so El Greco takes this kind of strange, strange instant incident and really, instead of normalizing it, makes it even stranger. Uh, I think especially the lighting on the garment is, is incredible. Uh, you look at how he elongates figures. This is St. Peter who has those keys, right? But he's, he must be 12 or 15 heads tall. An ideal proportion is seven and a half heads to uh, you know, ratio to the body. And so he is familiar with this stuff because he studies in Italy, but he eventually goes to uh, Spain and becomes the court artist in, in, of, of the king of Spain. Um, and, uh, and look at what he does with a landscape. Uh, now we notice the Germans had uh, already done landscape. This is roughly the same time. And his landscapes and his backgrounds are always interesting, but this is really a pure landscape. And it's a view of Toledo, not Toledo, Ohio, but Toledo, Spain, where you know, he's from. And it's very strange. And it's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So you can go see it. It has a very strange ghostly light that illuminates this little hilltop town. And it just, you know, if I did not know better and you just showed this to me in my PhD examinations as a 20th century specialist, I would say German Expressionism, maybe 1910. Uh, but it's not. Uh, it's it's uh, late Renaissance or Mannerist. Okay, so you might think, okay, okay. So for example, here is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and the angel comes and, and the, uh, the high priests, um, guards are coming to arrest him with his betrayer Judas Iscariot, and he's praying in the garden. And a look, because okay, so the angel comes to administer, uh, uh, he says, take this cup away from me. This, don't make me go through this. And, um, and, and then he resigns himself to his uh, destiny. But uh, look at again how it's lit. Look at how strangely distorted Jesus is. In the 19th century, they felt that maybe he had astigmatism. You know, I have astigmatism. It doesn't look like this. But notice also the strange scale. Notice this rock here. Notice how the cloud kind of comes over the rock incongruously. But most strange is this, hidden in this, I don't know what it is. It's a cloud or a rock or a cave are the sleeping disciples. The disciples having drunk too much wine at Passover uh, can't stay up with Jesus while he goes to the garden to pray. And so they fall asleep. And, and, and that's one of the reasons Jesus uh, is arrested because they're disoriented and they can't really defend him. And they had no idea that anyone was gonna arrest him uh, that evening. And so, but of course he knows, and, and it's just such a strange painting, you know? And the strangest thing, as I said, is no one says it's strange. That's a very strange. Here's another one. This is Jesus being baptized and up in heaven is God and the angels and so forth, okay? Again, lots of strange kind of distortions. If you actually see the paintings, they're large. They look like they were painted with miniature broomsticks. They're very painterly. They have a lot, you can see the brush strokes. You can see them dragging the paint across the surface. That's why German expressionists look at this stuff and they go, wow. Okay, now here's one, the burial of Count Ordaz. Now below, it, the count is being, who's dressed in armor is being lowered into the grave by the bishop and the deacon, surrounded by, I guess, his family and friends. And, uh, but in heaven, his soul is received into the heavenly realm. So here uh, below, as I said, people are still elongated. He, he really does the brocade beautifully. And in heaven, Jesus, Mary, um, John the Baptist, uh, Peter with his dangling his keys, and all sorts of saints and angels, are up there. But what I want to point out, 
and this has been pointed out before, is it also looks like a woman with her legs parted. And the angel is the infant, the newborn soul of the dead count is being taken into heaven. And the angel takes this baby soul and pushes it back into the birth canal for this rebirth in the heavenly realm. And it's not just me that sees this. This is, this is um, I tell my students, I'm not just a dirty old man that sees things like that in the clouds. I, uh, you know, this is uh, documented and it's a rebirth on a new and higher level. You might think this is Spain of the Inquisition. Why didn't they ask him, what are you doing? What does this mean? Well, they actually did call them to the Inquisition for this painting, uh, which is Christ, to, he's gone to the hill, the, the, they're getting the cross ready in the foreground, and the soldier is going to strip off his garment. And they said, why is his garment red? He's always shown with a white garment, perhaps stained a little with blood, but that represents his purity and his innocence, and you make it red. Why, right? Could have very dire circumstances, uh, uh, very dire consequences. And oh, Bracco just answers, look, um, he is the first martyr and the greatest of all martyrs. He precedes all other Christian martyrs who've given their life for Christ and would during those days where Christianity was illegal and so forth. And so I dress him in red because he's the first martyr. And when you have mass for a martyr, you, you the vestments are red. And so that represents his, him as the ultimate martyr. And the Inquisition said, oh, okay, you can go. And they didn't say anything about the weird space and, and you know the weird distortions of perspective, the elongated figures, the painterly uh, handling of, of the medium. They didn't say anything about it here. I'm gonna throw you a couple extra ones uh, just to give you an idea, maybe get a book on El Greco and look because he's the strangest of the strange. This is uh, Liakwan and his sons. We had seen earlier uh, interpretations of this. Liakwan is punished by the gods in mythology in, uh, and, and they send snakes down and his sons uh, are devoured by the snakes. And he does it not in Greece, uh, not in Troy, he's a priest in Troy, but uh, you know, in the hills surrounding Toledo. Um, very strange, very, very, very strange. Look at the treatment of the figures. Look at how they don't, have any gravitas, how they sort of flow. Here's even a stranger one. He gets weirder and weirder the older he gets. And he still keeps commissions and no one criticizes him for strange distortions. This is the vision of St. John, of St. John the Divine, the book of Revelation. The last book in the New Testament where there's all these strange four horsemen of the apocalypse and all these other, the horror of Babylon, drunk of them, blood of the martyrs and all these kind of very uh, trippy, hallucinogenic sort of uh, 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 iconography. And uh, here he's having the vision, but it's unclear what part of the vision he's actually having. It's unclear what are these women and men in the, these nudes, and what are they doing? What are their relationships to John, the ecstatic John who's looking at the vision? Now, some people have speculated that maybe there's only the bottom half of the painting that he didn't finish and they cut it off. That may be, I don't know, I don't have enough expertise in mannerism to call that shy, but uh, it is a strange painting. It's a very, look at how elongated John is. He's kneeling and he's that long, okay? Um, just to show you that he wasn't just someone who had astigmatism or whatever, here's an El Greco, here's another painting, I forget who it's by, Another court artist, very conservative, very, so he knew how to do it. Other lesser artists were able to just carry through this late Renaissance style simultaneously with this. Now, okay, now in the last five minutes, I wanna give you my own pitch and my own kind of spin on it because it's interesting to me, the historiography. And graphos means writing and historial, of course, means history. So we're talking the writing of history. What is the history of the history of mannerism, right? What is the historiography? How has mannerism been written? And we find if we look back in time, we find that contemporaneous accounts of it from 1500 to 1600, when it was happening, are uh, like Giorgio Vasari's Life of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects, 
that we've been referring to, you know, all, I was going to say all semester, we've been referring to for the last um, half a year. Also, the autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, a sculptor who, again, does both high Renaissance and weird manner of stuff. We didn't have time to look at him. Uh, he also uh, talks about it. And they talk about the manieri, the mannerists. It's generally positive evaluations. No one says it looks strange. No one says it looks unbalanced. No one objects to it. Uh, they just note it, right? It's just, you know, it's one of the manners that's done. Now, there are universally negative evaluations from 1600 on to 1900. So between the birth of the Baroque in 1600 and the birth of modernism in 1900, this 300 years just dismisses it as, um, as just worthless stuff coming at the embarrassing bad stuff. Probably they had bad vision, maybe they were drunk, you know, whatever. Really bad and they just don't like it and no one really even looks at it. Now, Here's where the plot begins to thicken for me as a modernist, right? Um, Regal um, uh, does, uh, writes this book on ancient Roman art and in late Roman art in 1901, he publishes it. And he, uh, give me a minute here to, to give you the background because it's, it's interesting when you get all together. This is a classical Roman portrait. It's um, Flavian, I believe. Um, uh, it's, um, well, it's one of the Roman emperors, Hadrian, it's Hadrian. And here is a couple centuries later, another emperor before the birth of Christianity. Notice how weird and strange the style is, how mannered, how large the eyes and so forth. Now, for hundreds of years, they had been saying, the poor Romans, they lost how to do it. They used to know how to carve real nice and then they got childlike and primitive and it all broke down. And then Christianity came and ruined everything. And, uh, and those are the dark ages, right? But Regal said no, because he found examples of very classical work that was being done at the same time as this uh, late emperor. So he did a late Roman style. He felt that this abstraction, which is not universally held, but this kind of abstraction of form was due not to that they didn't have the technique, but that they were looking for a more spiritual thing. They made the eyes large. And, and so you can see this leading right into Christian icons of, of you know, uh, 50 years later. So with that resuscitation of late Roman art, no, it wasn't that they didn't have skill. No, it wasn't that they, they had bad eyesight. They purposely moved away from the bodily uh, uh, realism of high Roman portraiture into a disembodied abstraction that ref reflected a movement towards spirituality that would eventually happen in Christianity. But even at this time, there are a lot of mystery cults and stuff in late Roman times. So this made us look again we began to think, ah, maybe these things that we thought were not skilled are just a matter of we're not looking at them in the right way. And Picasso comes around as an early, it's maybe 1902, woman ironing, very tired and so forth. And look at how similar it is to El Greco. This is El Greco. This is uh, St. Francis um, in the wilderness. And I chopped it off so it would be the same scale. And you can see those long fingers, the painterly quality of the application of paint. It's all directly. Picasso looks right at, 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 at El Greco. And in fact, El Greco was the first, um, uh, Dvorak was his name, uh, not the composer, but, but an art historian who wrote the first monograph on El Greco and said, no, El Greco was purposely distorting things. But it comes out of Regal. It comes out of that reevaluation of late Roman art. So, okay, now here comes my thesis. And I'm glad we're recording this because if anyone steals, I've been talking about this the last five years and never written it down. So now it's recorded. In the 1920s, we have Dvorak, Max Dvorak, talking about spiritualization of forms. It comes right out of Regal, right? Then Walter Friedlander does the first big book on, on, uh, on, uh, on mannerism, he calls it an anti-classical style. 
that they had our fill of perfection, idealization, harmony, and order, and unity, and they started just messing with things in an anti-classical way that's almost attacking the, the uh, tradition that they came out of. Um, and this was kind of the accepted art historical explanation was, oh, it was an anti-classical style. But remember, no one at the time said anything about anti-classicism or classicism, right? It was, they were just the manieri. Okay, now in the 1960s comes a, a new breakthrough with uh, Shearman, John Shearman, a British art historian. And he said, no, 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 it's the stylish style, it's manner. It's stylish, it's courtly, it's greater grace. We're hooked on some idea of the classical that comes from the 19th century, but these guys were just doing the stylish style, the mannered style. So they saw it as more grace, right? We see it differently. We, and so that it wasn't anti-classical at all. It was taking certain ideas of the Renaissance farther than they had been earlier. And at the same time, another art historian, Craig Smythe, talks about that pretzelized twisting shapes on the picture plane that we had talked about. It doesn't go deep into space, even though there's perspective. Everything, all the configurations kind of take place in the curly cute pretzel-like um, picture plane. Then in like 1969, Arnold Hauser, social historian of art, says that the whole thing is a breakdown uh, caused by the Reformation and all the repercussions of that, both theologically, but also sociologically, economically, and so forth, that it was just no longer possible after the sack of Rome, after the return of the plague in the 20s, uh, the 1520s, right? That it was just no, it was such a societal breakdown that uh, art can't any longer be perfect and so forth uh, like that. It would be unfair. Okay, so what's the best explanation? Why? You can't kind of have them both. It can't both be a more uh, mannered manner, it's more stylish style, and at the same time be anti-classical, okay? And we can interpret a painting like this either way, right? Go either way, stylish style, anti-classical style, okay? Now, in the 90s, in 98, comes an essay by Zirner, he's called, and he talks about mannerism is a 20th century construct. Art historians in the 20th century didn't know what to call these different directions, but actually there's no overarching anything. It's just these individuals coming out of these individual workshops that are trying new different things. Some of them are classical, some of them are anti-classical, some of them are the stylish stuff. There's all different sorts of stuff. And art historians have had this idea, they have to explain mannerism as this certain thing, like it's a movement in modern art or something, and it's not. Uh, okay, now, this is, okay, so that's all been done already. Here's my own twist on it. I noticed that in the 1920s, modern art in Europe in the 1920s, expressionism, surrealism, all the rest of it, was a rebellion against tradition. And at this very same time that contemporary artists were rebelling against tradition, Friedlander was writing this art historical interpretation of the past as anti-classical style. In the 60s, in contemporary art in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, abstraction won out, right? Avant-garde movements, uh, the building spirits of the night, they extended the directions. So early uh, expressionism kind of became abstract expressionism of Jackson Pollock after the war or uh, you know, pop art, anyway, all these kind of things, avant-garde uh, movements that are extending earlier things, right? The Bauhaus idea of less is more extends into minimalism, extending it farther and farther and farther. So uh, I think that, that Shearman, at the same time that modern artists are extending modernism, he's saying, oh no, mannerism isn't anti -class. It's extending stuff that was already there. Okay, and formalism was the main strategy of criticism. They looked at form above all. And that's why we see someone like the method of constructing a picture, Craig Smythe, it's a very formalist kind of thing. But also when you look at Hauser and a symptom of societal breakdown, think about the 60s, think about civil rights, think about the Vietnam War, think about all those kind of things 
that divided us. Now in the 90s, no one, we're past, we're postmodern. And everyone kind of does their own thing. Some of it's realistic, some of it's uh, conceptual, some of it's abstract, some of it's a pile of dirt in the middle of the gallery. I mean, there's all different sorts of directions and there's no movements, there's nothing like, there's no avant-garde. It's just everybody kind of doing their own thing. And this corresponds about 10 years after it starts with a, a, a conception of mannerism as going in all these different directions. So I think if you look at it historiographically, art history is a very founded in the contemporary art in which the art historian lives. Okay, so that's the end. Uh, actually, you could probably pass uh, my test for the upper division uh, class in Renaissance uh, uh, over the course of the last year. I've, Basically, it's everything I know. But we're not going to stop here. We're going to break a little bit for uh, for the Fourth of July, and we're going to go right on to the Baroque period that brings an end to Mannerist experimentation. And that's going to be Thursday, July fifteenth at eleven a.m. Same time, same channel as it always had been. That is Caravaggio's uh, a painting of the Medusa on a shield, right, beheaded. Caravaggio is very interesting because he's a psychopath. He murdered at least one man. He was accused of rape. He himself was probably murdered in this boating accident that didn't seem like an accident. So if there's ever an artist <laughs> who fulfills the idea of the artist as a rebel and a bad boy, it's Caravaggio. Uh, and so we'll devote our neck and the founder of the Baroque period and, uh, and uh, psychopath. Uh, and we'll look at him uh, next time.